Okay. Here. All right. Uh, welcome everyone to this session on Boost Process. It's the last session this week. It's not a complicated session, so no template meta programming, no proto. <laughs> 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 so it's just a good last session this week, I guess. Um, the session is about Boost Process, and if you didn't follow um, the mailing list in the past months or years, and you don't know um, what the status is about this process. I hope you didn't come here and expect me to tell you something about a process management library in Boost, because the truth is we don't have any Boost process library. Um, we had a review in March, um, we had a couple of drafts, and um, yeah, I proposed a review. We had that review in March, and the result of this review was that Boost process was rejected, not just because we had some tiny little problems we had to fix, but really rejected on all grounds. So if you came here to learn something about a process management library in Boost, it probably doesn't make sense to stay here for one and a half hours. Did you, so, did you back in that oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, no problem. Am I still in the picture? <laughs> or, <laughs> I'm going out of the room. Um, so, when I proposed to do this session here at BoostCon, I was actually pretty much sure that we will have an official Boost process library. I proposed the session a couple of months ago, before the review. Then we had the review. The review was, well, negative. And yeah, then BoostCon came and I had a problem because, well, what are you going to talk about now if you don't have a Boost process library? So I asked Hartmut whether we can change the session, whether I can uh, talk about Boost build on Friday instead of talking about Boost process. But Hartmut said, well, that's your problem. You have to entertain other people for one and a half hours. So that's why I'm here, that we are, we are going to talk about Boost process nevertheless. Now I will turn it around. It doesn't make much sense if I tell you something about a library which was rejected. So instead I'm going to tell you what we tried in the past, why the library was rejected, what ideas we have now. Maybe you can tell me what you think we should do next, whether you think the ideas we have make sense. So maybe we can come out of this session with some ideas what we can try next. Yes. I just want to thank you for for being part of making the review process work. That there, it's very easy to you know do a lot of hard work, get a, a rejected review, and just disappear. And I really appreciate that you're sticking with yeah. this and trying to take the feedback from the review into your next design. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's not that difficult for me to stand here and say the review was rejected because I don't really feel myself or see myself as the author of whose process. So I want to give you now a background where Boost Process is coming from. Um, I stumbled over the library in 2008 because I needed a process management library myself for a C++ project. And um, I thought, okay, I can just write the code myself to create a child process and to communicate with the child process. It's not that difficult. But I thought, let's see whether there is anything in Boost, whether there is a process management library. And I found then Boost Process in the sandbox. At that point, I didn't really know who had worked on Boost Process before. I must have missed um, the time when somebody created Boost Process. But I found the library in the sandbox, and I was looking at the library and trying to see whether I can use it. And I was then convinced, yeah, that is something I can use in my own project. It looks pretty much complete. Yes. Yeah, so the history of it is it was a summer of code project, a student project that was originally done. I don't know, six years ago now, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Julio something. I yeah, have yes, slides. Know, yeah. He's got slides. Uh, right. I to try to restructure where the library is actually coming from. Okay, good. So in uh, 2008 I found this library and I used that library for one of my projects. If you take a library from the sandbox, you better check the entire code because you are not sure what the quality of the code is. So I became very much familiar with the library, not only um, I understood the interface, but also the implementation. And it looked like to me that 90% of the library is done, that there's only a little bit missing to complete the library. But yeah, that was three years ago, and we still don't have a uh, finished, complete, <coughs> official boost process version. But as I found something in the sandbox, <coughs> which was nearly complete, yeah, up to 90%, I thought I just need to fix a couple of things, maybe update the documentation, write a lot of test cases, propose a library for a review, and it's done. So I'm not really the author of the library. I see myself more as a project manager 
who was trying to make sure that all this work somebody else did before is not forgotten and lost. Because I thought 90% is already done, we just need to do a little bit more and we have a process management library used. So that's the background and if you feel like you need to criticize the library, I don't mind, just, just go on, it's just fine for me. And as the review was not negative, it's not a problem for me either. Um, I still think that we can finish the library, I still think that we don't need to do that much to finish Boost process. After all, we are not talking about template metaprogramming here, it's nothing about proto, it's actually rather simple standard C++, just getting the design right. The implementation we have now after five years is also working, we have lots of test cases, if you like you can use Boost process as it is. People were mainly complaining about yeah, the overall design, but if we just take the existing code and yeah, change it somehow, maybe we can get a Boost process version pretty soon. Now, the, the basic question you maybe ask yourself is, what's, what's the problem? I mean, if you think about processes, it is something we have on Windows, it is something we have on another operating system. You create a child <coughs> process and you have to just pass um, some command line options, maybe change some environment variables. It's not that difficult. If you show um, you one example, this is a very simple program which looks for an executable called hostname. And if it finds the executable somewhere in path, it gets the absolute path to that executable, and it uh, forwards the path here in that Excel variable to a function create child, create child, creates the child process, and it all works. So you wonder what, what's really the problem here? I mean, why do we need five years to talk about a library which does something which doesn't seem to be so difficult? Now, if you um, follow the mailing lists, you have maybe seen that there have been a lot of discussions from time to time. So we did not only have the review in March, we had a six-week discussion last year in summer. And after this week, six-week six discussion, we got a lot of feedback <coughs> and spent in another half a year to work on tiny little details. And that's why I was pretty sure that the review will not be that difficult in March because after all we had a lot of discussions before, but yeah, I, I was obviously wrong. If I think about the reasons, I think it comes down to um, yeah, these requirements um, people have, and if we go now through the requirements, it's difficult to create a library which really meets all of them. So first we have people who say we want cross-platform code, we don't want any if-devs, after all, makes sense, we are here boost. But if you, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I'm just going to have a little problem with this. I mean, who are these people? Have they ever like written a Boost library? library? <laughs> because yeah. this doesn't exist. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, if -defs in, no if defs in my usage of the library, or no if defs inside the library. In your user yeah, code. In your user oh, code. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. I think that would be the I retract my statement. Yes. Yes. So if you think about it, if you think about the concepts we have in the operating system, we have a couple of things which exist really everywhere. That fortunately, we have child processes in all operating systems. When we create a child process, we can often pass command line options, we can change environment variables. These are concepts which exist everywhere. But when you want to try something more, like on Unix, you want to somehow configure file descriptors greater than two, well, you don't have this on Windows. And on Windows, again, if you want to do something else with this startup infrastructure, you want to set some security descriptors, well, you don't have this again on Unix. And if you restrict yourself to the um, small subset of features or concepts which exist on all platforms, you can of course create a cross-platform library which does exactly these things. But the question is, is this enough? What do people do who need to do more things? They probably need to use another library. So that is one position um, I think I saw on the mailing list. And the other one, the opposite position is, and of course, um, yeah, I want to use system-specific features. If I can just create a child process and I can just pass some command and options, that is not enough. I need to be able to configure more file descriptors on Unix, for example. I need to pass file descriptors to the child process greater than two. And if the library doesn't allow me to do this, it's of no use for me. Then we have people, well, not only some people, but I guess everybody wants to have this. We want to have a very simple interface, and yeah, if we just look at the 
first slide again. This looks pretty simple. But then you have other people who say, yeah, simple is good, but if the simple interface does not do that, what I want, and I cannot change it, again, the library is of no use for me. So I need to somehow maybe create my own boost process version. I need to take yeah, different pieces and set them together to um, create chart processes and manage the chart processes the way I want to. And if the interface is too simple, well, it's again, no use for me. So yeah, we have people on the mailing list who say, yeah, cross platform code, my if this. And yeah, problem is, how, how, are we doing, how are we going to support this? We have only a few um, concepts which we can really implement in a cross platform manner. I mean, we, these are just the same items I just explained. We want system specific features. Um, yeah, what I can maybe say here about is that in early versions of Boost Process, we had um, one generic class, like if you think about it, one class to represent a child, child process. And we had another class in the POSIX namespace, which represented a POSIX child process. And we had a third class in the Windows namespace. Uh, if, if you create a library like this, yeah, okay, it's good because everybody can pick those classes and those code from the namespace they need. But if you think about it, how are, how are you going to design this? The generic class, okay, is obvious. You just take the concepts which exist on all platforms and you put them into the generic class. The system-specific classes obviously have to follow the system-specific APIs. So if you know you want to use a certain Windows feature and you look at the system-specific classes and they look pretty similar to the Windows API, it's easy for you to use the Windows feature you're interested in. But if you have one generic class and other classes which model the system APIs, you really end up with three libraries. If you, was this on? Uh, I was just wondering if any, you know, we have a model for this sort of thing in Bruce that, that has been accepted and works uh, in the thread library, for example, mm -hmm. which is, you know, you make a, you have a portable thread object and then there's a way to get a platform specific handle to it and then you just use the platform APIs to deal yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we actually got also rid of these approach having three different classes, one for the generic code and one for POSIX and Windows. So that is something we had in the early versions of Boost Process. But yeah, in, in the end we have really three different libraries in one and uh, we got rid of that. So just following up on Dave's comment though, um, the thread library in Santa has this problem that you can't pass system specific initialization parameters to the thread. And uh, so We'd have a similar thing with the process library where, say, on Windows, security descriptors are set at process creation. So right. we're well, still I'm sort of missing that abstraction. Well, I think that I think, if I'm not mistaken, the thread library you can take a system-specific thread and adopt it, right? Yes. Which yes. So yes. so you can use the system API to create the thread and then stuff it into a, a boost thread. But that doesn't work with processes mm -hmm. and those Windows security rules. Which is also a problem we have with Why wouldn't that work with processes? Sorry? Why wouldn't that work with processes? We will is look it at possible to change them during flight in the security model? Yeah, we will no, look no, at no, some no, code no, no. to see how the library is used, but in the end it really turned out to be very difficult to make just one generic class, for example, and make it still somehow extensible so that people can plug in um, some features on some platforms. So we yeah, have we tried this. We at first had different classes for different platforms. Now we have one class, one generic class. We tried to integrate somehow kind of extension points. But yeah, we are not that happy with it. And yeah, we're still trying to find out a model which works. Well, let me just be clear. Uh, I, I don't want to derail your presentation or anything. Yeah. But I, I'm not at all talking about adding extension points or anything. It's like a very low-tech solution. Yeah. The idea is to to expose the platform specific information so that people when they're when they know they need to do platform specific things they just use the platform specific APIs that they already have yeah, yeah. on their platform yes and and that's it yeah, yeah. and we'll get into um, yeah 
yeah. looking at what the differences are between Windows and POSIX. It's a totally different paradigm between the two and ways on being able to access uh, and have available the information at the right time uh, of process creation. Okay, so uh, uh, just one last thought on this because it, this is, you know, making my my blood pressure go up. <laughs> because, you know, because I want boost process actually. And so, of course, I was too distracted during the review. And if I hadn't been distracted during the review, I'm sure I would have had some, some things to say about this. Um, but we... There is a history here, right? And and I think you know going forward, this is something that Boost can do better on, because this is a certain class of library that has this issue, right? And the other libraries that have this issue are system file system, uh, Osio, uh, threads. and threads. So you know we have four or five other libraries, and I think what we haven't done is say when we're dealing with these platform specific things, what are we doing from a design perspective, as Dave is pointing out? We have some history here about how to do it, and maybe it's not perfect, but I hate to see a good library get derailed because yeah, you yeah. Know, of this issue. So what I'm right now doing is I'm, I'm looking backwards, just trying to explain okay. what we did in the past and what right. didn't work out. At some point, Jeff will take over because he had, a, as I think, a very good idea of what we can try next, okay. which maybe solves all these problems. Just want to try to explain you what we did actually five years, what, what we tried and what didn't work out, and what I think why it didn't work out, because we have these different requirements and different positions. Yeah, interface as simple as possible, and yeah, at the same time, people want the library to be very flexible, and yeah, the more flexible it is, the more difficult maybe the interface gets. Now, just look back at uh, <laughs> what we did in the past years, where does boost process come from? And it was already said that we had the very first version of Boost Process in the year 2006. Somebody was working in the Google Summer of Code program 2006. Someone called Julio Vidal. I haven't seen him on the mailing list. I don't know, he probably disappeared at some point. But that was the first version of Boost Process. It didn't really have a version number, but I started to give it some version numbers. So as you see, we have so many different versions. When people send an email to the mailing list, and they have a problem with boost process and they want to figure out something. The first question I always ask is, well, which version of boost process are you actually working with? And yeah, they, most of the people don't use these version numbers. They often answer them. They use that version which was downloaded from there. But I tried to structure it a little bit and gave the different drafts version numbers. Now, Julio was working in that Google Summer of Code program 2006, created a first version that was, yeah, somehow complete. He continued to work on this version in 2007, but left then in the middle. And that was the version I found um, in the sandbox. So he had worked a little bit more on his um, boost process version from the Google Summer of Code program. Probably he got some feedback from the mailing list, but yeah, he then disappeared and left the library as it was in the sandbox. In 2008, I stumbled over the library, I found it in the sandbox, I thought, okay, great, I can use it, it's pretty much complete. But it looks like that at the same time, other people, <coughs> yeah, thought the same, and we had suddenly lots of different folks. So some people had used the library on Unix and had changed something on Unix, added support for some Unix-specific features. Other people had worked on Windows and added some code on Windows. And I tried now to merge all of this again to make sure that um, we really have just one draft and that we all work on the very same version. And that is something I did in 2008. And I was just done and I thought, great, we have one version again. Before I sent the email to the mailing list to announce we have one unified boost process version again, someone else, Ilya Sokolov, proposed or had created another fork of boost process. So I was like, can't really be. I was working for a couple of months unifying all these forks, and then somebody else came with a new fork. Um, that is a um, pretty interesting fork because if you look at that one in the sandbox, it is really very much complete. And I think if Ilya um, had went on to propose maybe this library to be reviewed, I don't know, maybe we would have had now already a boost process version. But anyway, that version also ended up in the sandbox. I spent then again a little bit more time the next year to merge my version again with Ilya's version from the sandbox. I fixed a couple of things, I added test cases, 
and then in 2009 we had that version um, 031. That is a version which is actually used quite a lot because I created a tutorial and put that one on my website and I think when people look at that tutorial they think oh the library must be pretty good, the library must be complete and yeah people started to use uh, 031 but yeah it's still just another draft uh, in the sandbox. What happened then in 2010 I thought um, yeah now after merging all these different forks now let's concentrate on the missing 10 percent and I did this in the Google Summer of Code program with a student from Brazil so I was mentoring that student and he was working on um, that library from 2009 and yeah that was uh, something done last year we had then after the Google Summer of Code program a six week discussion on the mailing list we got some feedback we worked another half a year on uh, tiny little details which people had criticized in the six week discussion then I proposed the library for the review happy that I was done yeah and then the library was rejected and that's where we are today so the latest version I call 0.4, that's the version right now in the sandbox, and that's where we stand now. So what are the things we tried and what did we give up? Uh, as I said already before, in the very early drafts, we had uh, generic code and we had code for POSIX and for Windows. So when you were creating a child class, for example, you could use a launch function, you could pass um, yeah, the path to the executable, some command line options, and a context which describes, for example, the environment variables. That was the code which was cross-platform. Here you had yeah, similar code, but for POSIX only. And in this case, you could, for example, stuff some more things into the context object which were only available on POSIX. How much of the context object? Just out of curiosity, how much of the context? Think, is the context object half the same across two platforms, or it's almost completely different across two platforms? It's it, that was a question we could not really answer because the context thing is just a class, and we had to add some member variables there. So when somebody said, "I want to use, I want to set the user ID of the child process," we had to add a member variable. If somebody else said, "I want to do something else," we had to add another one. So the, at some point the context class grew and grew and grew and we said, well, it will never be complete and you can never extend it in the end. And yeah, at that point we said, well, this doesn't really work out. So yeah, the idea was at that point we have a few generic classes for a minimum set of cross-platform features and the other platform-specific classes for everything beyond. But as I said already, it didn't work out. We would have had in the end three different libraries in one and we gave that up. That was the original design and I think we kept that design for a few years and we gave it only up 2009. So yeah, that's how it currently looks like. Why is context uh, not just a, a process object? And, and you know, it seems that context is being held outside of creating this child. Yes, yeah, so the idea was that when the child object is created, but at that point, it represents a running child process. So okay. it's like a factory function, and only when we have the object, you know the child process exists. I think one way to look at it is, is it's a big pack of arguments to the constructor. That, yes. That's what I was missing. I, it seemed like the constructor would be modifying context, uh, but if that's not the case, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, actually, we see now context, just to give you an idea of what we put into that context class. We had a process name, that is this first argument um, of yeah, the main function. Um, you have a work directory, you have environment variables. You can put in all, all kind of things which you think are important to set up a child process, but yeah, it is never enough. And if you have then POSIX or Windows specific code, you want to put in more things, well, in the end you have to hack the library and add your member variables there. I mean, this code all works. If you like, you can use a library. And yeah, I've seen open source projects using the code, but in the review, people said it doesn't look like right. If you look at the context class, it's a bunch of variables which we just put there because we didn't know where else we should put them. But it doesn't look like that there is a clear design. 
What else did we have? We have uh, the possibility to communicate with the child process. <coughs> that is the whole idea. Otherwise, we could use a system function. We want to create a child process, and uh, then we want to somehow send data, for example, to the standard input stream of the child process. And we want maybe to read data from the standard output stream of the child process. And you could set up now um, stream behaviors here in Boost process. You could, for example, create a pipe and bind that pipe to the standard output stream of the child process. And then you could access that pipe here in your parent process and communicate through that pipe with the child process. Um, again, all of this works, but uh, the problem we had here, for example, is that when you create a pipe, you get two ends of the pipe. And most of the time, when you think about a pipe, you have a read end and a write end. And if boost process would allow you to create such a pipe, you could probably use the pipe for other things too. But in this case, this pipe had to return a parent and a child end, because boost process somehow need to know what it should use for the parent process and for the child process. And it could not always be a read and a write end, because in the end it depends whether you want to send data to the child process or you want to read data from the child process. So. It again really didn't fit into the concept um, what we normally use when we think about a pipe. We would like to use a read and a write end when we create a pipe, but here we had to use a um, child and a parent end, so you cannot again reuse the pipe for anything else, which is not so nice. <coughs> the other thing is that when you were thinking about um, using a pipe and having a read and a write end, and you want not to do something different, like simply redirecting standard C out of the child process to a file. You don't have really a read, uh, you don't have really a child and a parent end. You just need to tell um, the child process whatever you write to standard C out should go to a file. And this didn't really fit into the process, into our concept with having two ends. So when you wanted to change the standard output stream of a child, you still needed always two ends, even so you don't need two ends when you just want to redirect standard output to a file, uh, to, a pa uh, to, a, uh, to a file. So you could not really use something that simple like boost pass in order to redirect standard output stream to a file. You always had to set up somehow um, a parent and a child and even so it didn't make any sense for something simple like redirecting standard output. What else did we try? Yeah, we had the problem that people said just calling create child is not enough. I want, for example, to change on Windows the startup infrastructure just before the child process is created. You know Windows, there's this create process function and you can pass the startup infrastructure to create process to set a couple of options. And what we tried to do then yeah, was kind of a hack we added a function pointer here to the context class so you could bind a function and this function would be called with the startup infrastructure just before create process is called so you can still tweak some settings but again it, it obviously looks like a hack and yeah it again it works but people said yeah okay this works but if I want to change something else in create chart I can't do it in the end create chart is a function which is hard coded in the library and yeah, either it works for me or it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, I have to use another library or I have to hack the code. Then, as I'm a big Plus ASIO fan, I um, tried to create an I.O. object here for Boost process, which allows you to wait asynchronously for a child process to exit. So what I did, I created here a new class status which you bind here to an IO service object. When you have a child process, you get the idea of a child process, you call async wait, and yeah, when the child process exits, you, um, the library here calls the end wait handler. Again, all of this works, but when you look here into the implementation of the status class, it's a huge mess, especially if you think about uh, the different operating systems again, on Windows, you wait very differently for a child process to exit than on Unix. On Unix, you ideally use signals, 
if you try to put all of this here into the status class, it's really getting messy. So it, it works again, but the implementation is not very efficient. And in the end, this is more like Java. You create a class which works and which hides all the different, which hides all the platform specific differences. But yeah, it's, it's not really C++ if you look into this class and you see what I tried to do there. Yeah, so I, I'm not that sure myself whether this was a good idea to create this class. But again, you, the client, there's no if defs in the client code. It looks good from a client point yes. of view and I can move it from platform to platform. Yeah, I think on Windows it really works nice because uh, there we can create a service for Boost ASIO and I think yeah, the Windows implementation calls wait for multiple objects yeah. and it works really great. But um, yeah, people said in the review maybe it makes more sense to use a signal and fortunately I learned that uh, a signal I.O. object is now part of Boost ASIO of a future version so maybe the problem automatically disappears. Well, um, I'm not even sure it does because the process model is quite different when you're talking about it but on POSIX platform we have the problems of zombie processes and so, whereas on Windows, the process can go away, but you've got the handle, which you can still wait on. And maybe it's possible to abstract all of that away from the user, but they certainly don't want to end up spawning 100 child processes and then seeing 100 zombies until their um, process exits, say. So, uh, I, I don't know, I guess you must have had to do something. Like, you have to wait for a process. Yeah, POSIX, you must wait. Yeah. yeah. But in Windows, you can just let it go. And not, you don't care anymore. So um, I don't use here in status any signal. I think I call wait pit, yeah. or what the function is called. And yeah, I mean, it, it somehow works, but yeah, people said, well, maybe I just try to wait for a signal and it's much easier. But that, w what you're saying though is that. Uh, well, so the OS is going to give you that single termination of the child, or, or, or is that something custom you're going to have to do? Um, I think the problem was that if you call wait pit... That blocks. Yeah, it blocks. It is definitely caught in a background thread. Yeah. But the problem is if you have somewhere else a library which calls wait pit, I think that library could get the return value of the process. I think the problem was somehow that if you really want to use this I.O. object on POSIX, you must make sure that nothing else in your program um, somehow messes up the code in this well, The same is true for the signal handler because you have to hook into the sick child anyway. Yeah, it was a kind All of all the like stuff this. that yeah. was there before, or someone else does that. So yeah, I'd yeah. say it's equivalent. Yeah. With, with Windows, it's easy because if you call wait for multiple objects, you, you can really path the handlers of the child process you want to wait for. And on Unix, it, uh, the problem I had was something like. When you use this I/O object, you have to make sure that nothing else in your program tries to wait for child processes too, because then there's nothing well, else being this, notified. For you this specific child process, isn't it? I have to check again the implementation, but it was getting yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but does this library really have to solve that problem? I mean, it, it, you can just state, you know, you cannot have other processes waiting on these bits yes. yeah. and use this library. Yeah. Yeah, and that's just a restriction of using the library. Absolutely, absolutely. Could be another option, yeah. Especially if you try to do too many things, yeah. we might never get somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But this is, this is an, in an interesting different case where it's not so much the interface was the problem, it was more... More the implementation, the implementation yeah. yeah. And, you, you, know. you wanted to use an I object and it worked, but you had to think about ten different things because, yeah, you could easily break the implementation. Yeah. It's fragile. Yeah. Now, that was yeah, an overview on things we tried in the past and um, yeah, why we think that didn't really work out. And after this review, I thought already, okay, what's going to happen next? But fortunately, Jeff followed the review too. And I think he had a nice idea. And yeah, Jeff, if you like, you can now take over and present your idea. So I'd like to see that you have some comments and give some feedback because yeah, maybe we get out of this session and have a little plan of what we can try next.
Okay, just give you a little background of what my application is. Um, I work for Gene Codes Corporation and we do DNA sequencing software. Uh, and over like the last couple of years, the whole technology behind um, measuring DNA and getting the uh, sequence information has changed. Um, and there's several algorithms out there now that are research projects on SourceForge or, or even um, some companies like Genentech have their own proprietary algorithms. Uh, they tend to be uh, SIGWIN uh, developed uh, standalone applications. Um, so <clears throat> since this is in such a state of flux, we didn't want to spend a lot of time developing one particular algorithm, putting it into our software. So what we needed to do was come up with an approach where we had access to these external services. So we run on both Windows and Mac. Um, on Windows, we need to launch other native Windows applications, console applications, and then also SIGWIN um, applications. On the Mac, um, since it's POSIX, uh, we launch native Mac applications as well as um, uh, effectively the console applications on Mac. Um, so we needed a way of being able to do that in a portable manner. Uh, we were using QProcess for a little bit, and because of the way we're actually interacting with some pretty old technology that runs under Rosetta on the Mac, um, we found that with QProcess, one of the problems is there's little granularity in their library. Just bringing in QProcess added six megabytes to our executable size. Um, and then the other problem is they have a bunch of static variables that get instantiated, some of which affect the event loop on the Mac. So that was kind of thrown out. Um, and we needed another approach to deal with that. Uh, so we started using Boost Process, I think probably uh, in January or February. It was a few weeks before the review was going to start. And we ran into uh, some issues, um, problems that I was hearing from other members of our team. Um, we kind of have a, an approach that we want to be able to push down any platform dependencies down into other libraries or as low as we can. And we found that with using Boost Process, we were end up having to do a lot of if def code out in our client code. Uh, so we we're trying to think through, well, how can we deal with this? We we're going to look at developing our own. We looked at, at Boost Process. And um, so what I first did was took a look at, well, what is going on with Create Child? Because I needed to do some slightly different things that were in there. And so I looked at Create Child, and pretty much we got a, a, a mix of uh, POSIX API and Windows specific things. There was a lot of stuff dealing with handles. Um, and we had, well, we, we do more of an iterative development, so the first thing we wanted to do was the simplest thing. We wanted to, on Windows, launch a GUI application. GUI applications on Windows don't have standard in, out, or error, so why did we have to provide that information on, on that particular application? So if you look through Create Child, there's a lot of handle dealing stuff. And again, more handle issues um, in the child process. You want to make sure you close any other handles that got inherited automatically. And then finally, you get down into uh, the POSIX system call where you fork. Um, and then you're going to dispatch based on the return type of that. And again, you've got more handle-related <laughs> issues to deal with. And then there was an opportunity to call the CTX setup function to do some specific things that you needed to uh, in between the call that was made to fork and exec. So this code that we're seeing here will be getting executed in the child process. Um, so it gave you an opportunity to do some things. Uh, uh, 
and there were some there's some major limitations on what methods you could or functions you can call in between there when you're launched uh, in a separate thread. I think it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so finally, we get through and, and do the exact call. And if um, the fork failed, the parent application goes and does some cleanup um, and finally returns. So you can kind of think of all that stuff done on the POSIX side is partially because it's, it's kind of similar to doing multi-phase construction of an object. And there's a lot of things that need to go on and be dealt with. Uh, on the Windows side, um, you have this whole startup info structure that can have uh, values modified. Uh, the first thing that I looked at was, well, uh, startup use standard handles was set in, in that particular case where I wanted to launch a Windows <laughs> GUI application. I could get that because it was being passed in through startup info, but as somebody else mentioned, there's a lot of security things. I didn't have to use them at this point, but I thought, well, there's no way of accessing those from this context class. Um, so if you look down in the create process call, um, there's no way to get at all these null values being passed in, as well as the uh, Boolean was always true. Uh, the other thing that we ran into was um, being, you know, American, any other character set other than ASCII looks funky to us. So uh, this could not handle any of our customers' funky characters. Um, we have a really good QA group. We put something together that afternoon. It was, this doesn't work on simplified Chinese. So, you know, we were trying to look at, well, okay, we need to address that issue too. So pretty much it goes through, does some more of the uh, handle assignments, uh, which was the other thing that we ran into was we get back this child class and it has a map of handles that we didn't even need to deal with. So we're paying the cost for carrying around this map even though it's empty. So the first thing I did was Okay, how can I get my mind around what was going on there? There's two different platforms I'm having to deal with. Very different ways of doing things. Uh, there's a lot of handle stuff going in here. So what I first did was kind of looked at the code there, uh, just factored things out. So it looks like we've got stuff going on in the parent before a fork. Uh, we do the fork, and then based on the results of that, we're either in the child or the parent and whether we uh, actually succeeded or failed, uh, we need to go off and do those sorts of things. On the window side, it's a little bit different. So I started looking at this and thinking, you know, there's all these things that need to be going on. So the first thing that I usually try to do, you know, based on old C++ user's journal articles, uh, is looking at dependency inversion. Is there a way I can from outside, modify a lot of the state information that's required when you make that call to fork exec as well as create process. Uh, so then I started thinking, well, I've got these various phases going on. It kind of brought to mind the visitor concept of BGL, where um, before you discover a node, you do something after you discover it. Um, so there's kind of this multi-visitor uh, concept going on. So I thought, well, maybe if you looked at this exec method, like the accept method on, a, uh, on the visitor concept. Uh, and then if you pass in some sort of list of initializers that then get called back with anything they need from that particular uh, executor concept, and uh, they can modify any piece that they need to. That way, you can kind of compose when you make this call to create child what um, 
pieces that you actually need to modify. So then I thought, okay, so if we had this thing that had methods that could be called at any one of those different phases, um, these five different phases of uh, launching the process, both from the parent process as well as from the, the child process. So we have this where we have an initializer concept. So anybody that would provide uh, all these member functions that could be called. And then I have showing here some um, lazy sorts of things that we'll see that it makes it a little bit easier, um, less code down in uh, when we want to call these things. So if we have a bunch of these initializers, and what I'm showing here is we have one, the first thing you want to be able to do is specify the path to the executable and maybe the working directory. <clears throat> so from user code, you would call the constructor. And also kind of the concept I thought too, not really a concept, but I guess a, a philosophy is there's a lot of stuff in Boost that already accounts for a lot of platform differences. The first and foremost one being file system paths. Um, we had some discussion earlier about the Unicode. It's handling a lot of that automatically for us. And in our client, in our application, we just return file system paths. They get populated either out in a dialog box or from the registry or the plist um, off on the Mac. So then the client constructs this executor, which has all the member variables in it that are going to need to be passed through to call to exec or the call to create process. And we end up on um, Windows switching over to create process W so we can handle Unicode characters. And then you call the exec function passing in a fusion vector of all your initializers. In this case, it's just a, a path. The executor then comes back, passes itself a reference to itself to the path initializer. In this case, it turns around, it sets the executor's executable path variable. You also need to take that path string and use that as the first argument that gets passed through exec VE or um, uh, create process. So that calls back into executor and sets those pieces of information. So you might have other ones out there that then get called doing the same thing at that pre fork stage. In this case, we don't need to do anything else after the fact. Any uh, values of uh, boost file system path get destructed when this guy's destructor gets called. And then the fork happens, and I assume everybody's familiar with fork exec, how that works. So it makes a whole copy of your whole process. The executor then calls post fork child. It asks this uh, paths initializer to do its thing, which is to do a change directory. And in our case, um, we want to be able to, if there's an error with change directory, if it doesn't exist, we want to be able to indicate back to the executor that there was a problem. And we actually have another initializer that deals with uh, whether you want to throw an exception in the parent 
process if there's a an exact failure um, or some failure in that fork process before exact is called. So basically what this guy ends up doing is just an exit with particular exit code. And uh, that other initializer actually has a pipe set up so it can retrieve back what the system error was at that time. So pretty much all the initializers file, file, follow this sort of sequence diagram. So to keep things straight in my mind, I mean, when I looked at that initial uh, create child method, my eyes just started glazing over. I can only keep so much in my mind at one time. So what I did was I split out into a separate namespace um, a concrete implementation of a paths initializer. And in the Windows namespace, there's another one. And uh, basically because much of the information was very different between them. Uh, in Windows, I need to be dealing with, um, well, on, the, on POSIX, I can just deal with chars. The reason I'm having to put things back into a vector of chars is there's not much cons correctness in a lot of these um, functions that deal with <coughs> OS sorts of uh, things, both in uh, create process, I think, if you use the wide interface, it needs to be able to access, or it needs a non-cons pointer to a lot of these um, arguments that are being passed in. So often that uh, parent process we just constructed, I've got two different constructors. One just takes an executable. So we construct, we just copy that into a um, path data member. Uh, we need a working directory, and on the Mac in particular, uh, we found that an application is actually a bundle, which is effectively a subdirectory. You kind of have to drill down into that to get the actual executable that gets launched. And if you don't set the working directory uh, to where that is located, it just will fail to launch. And I forget what the error is that it gives you, but it took us a little while to figure out what was going wrong there. And then uh, we copy into this chars because we need to do that before we actually uh, fork because you can't allocate any memory um, when you're between that fork exec call. Jeff, quick question about the, what you just described with the Mac. Should that be a platform specific issue? I mean, should there be a, a Mac process type that does that for you rather than relying on posits? Um, so like I don't need to, to change directory um, on Unix to, to, to start a process, right? But you do on, on an OS, on, on Mac OS. The, the design question would be whether you can call blah, blah, blah dot app and then some magic kicks in on Mac, or you know, to I, leave that out? we looked at that, and one of the other members of mm -hmm. uh, our group looked at that, and he was saying from POSIX, when you're doing the exec, uh, you have to use this approach on a Mac. On a Mac, right? But now I have to have code. I have to have code in in, in my application that says if I'm running on a Mac, I have to change directory, right? Or I have to pass this No, all you do is call this constructor uh, with just the path, and it will set the working directory for you. But, but And that. also, there's uh, applications under Windows that we were dealing with that have DLLs in their directory, and they're not setting the path to point to those. Um, so to be able to get those to launch appropriately, we ran into this case also. So that's kind of why we set this as um, the behavior when you create one of these paths initializers, you only have to pass in the single path to the executable and it automatically sets the working directory. 
In other cases where we don't want that, um, we can pass in the working directory. We have the second constructor. But what if I want the working directory to be the current working directory? Uh, boost file system has a current path function that you would call, and you would just pass the result of that in here. So the second constructor doesn't work on that? No, it does. Uh, it will if they're not Mac apps. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what I'm saying. So if I have a Mac app, I can't use that second constructor. You don't magically set the current working directory to get it started and then change it back to what I want it to be. Correct. Or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm trying to think. <clears throat> I think that would be surprising to most users that they would call paths an executable path and it would just change to that directory. On a, posit on, a, on a Unix environment, that would be surprising behavior. And you'd want to just pass the path to the executor. Mm -hmm. It's usually worse than surpri surprising behavior, right? Because depending on where, what the working directory is, the behavior of lots of applications differs uh, on Unix. Okay. Well, what we could have then uh, is a static make function in this pass class, you know. Uh, well, I think you just want to do some save and restore. Of the, like, if you have to change your path to you get the process running, you do that. And then, you know, once it's running, you can put things back to the way I, I was expecting them to be or something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's several different approaches that we could take to deal with that. Um, the second constructor gives you the full capability of either calling file system current path, make sure that the child process um, has its working directory as the current working directory. Jeff, I think Stephen had a question. Yeah, I was just saying that how is it even possible to change and then change back? Because once you're in the ch child process, that's <coughs> outside of your control. Yes. But this um, initializer has a post fork child method that gets called right. after the fork before the exec is called. So okay, yeah, you you would have that problem. But, yeah, yeah, unless the application you're launching then turn around and uh, reset the directory appropriately. So it need, really needs an if step for a Mac. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Inside this. So you would want this just to use the current? It's, it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not just well, Mac, it's, a, it's, it's um, Windows as well. But this is a POSIX only. I know, but at an Windows. API level, okay. maybe there should be some constructor that you call this out. What I'm launching is an application, not just an individual process. Yeah. Um, and then the, the documented behavior is we will set the directory to that of the executable and right, do what's right on that platform. Just do the, the simple thing on that platform. Or an application. Yeah, it would be nice to have something like the raw interface and then something where you can put in, okay, do the magic thing. For applications. And yeah. for that, it Which really then nice would find say, dot app on Macs exactly. and do something magic and maybe do something fancy in Windows as well. But that you get the raw behavior that you'd expect from a simple API as well. Something mm -hmm. like, I want the breakage if I run the app. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that could be done with additional constructors to this, or as I said, a, a static uh, method that returns a paths, um, and it could be named, you know, native Mac app or, or something well, like that. Well, just like make application paths or something like that. Right. And if, if that's the behavior you want, you call that on all platforms and it's um, on other Unix platforms where it doesn't matter, you just get the, the regular behavior. Well, no, I, I think no, this I, would be a really good concept that you can state in your program without if there's something like um, do Windows security context magic, which in the other cases does nothing. There, there is an almost equivalent magic composites involving set UID and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, okay. If it's almost equivalent, I'd it's call one Windows and the other Unix. <laughs> You're dangerous. That's all I can say. <laughs> but, but yeah, I think as a general rule, I, what I'd like to see is 
high, like higher level help functions mm -hmm. based on the class of program that I want to launch. So I want yep. to launch an application or I want to launch a child process. Um, and actually I was thinking earlier on when Boris was talking, it would be nice to distinguish between a detached child and one that I want to wait for. Because in a detached child case, you probably, probably do a double fork, yes. and then you no longer get the signal back to the parent. And you definitely want to do that if you're launching like a Mac app, because it's now it's a user interface process. You Actually, a detached app with a, a, a daemon process is, is important because there is a magical incantation of things that you have to do, and it's hard to get right. You know, well, it's always cracking open. From the, the parent's point of view, rather than well, both both have to, both have to do this, right? So you have to set the session ID. You know. Because we we have this problem with the waiting is quite different, and. On POSIX, if you don't do the wait, you will end up with zombies hanging around. And the way to solve that is the double fork, right? So you're only waiting for the, um, the initial child, not the, the grandchild. So you have that level of indirection. But, but you need to be able to specify that at the launching point, not not as after the process is launched, it's, it's too late. It's right. Like, yeah, maybe you know, launch application, launch attached child. Maybe there's a whole bunch of things um, other people might have use cases for. Um, so if we look at the Windows executor exec method, which is effectively the um, accept method for this, uh, it has a, a different set of phases that it goes through. We have a pre-create, and then based on the return type or the return value of create process W, we either call post create or fail create. Oh, sorry, yeah, to jump in here as well, actually. I can't remember the details, but on Windows 7, I think you actually had to use some of the shell execute functions to deal with, um, what do they call them, the user access control dialogues. And to create process would fail in certain cases due to um, the security model. And if you actually wanted to launch a child correctly, then you had to use shell execute X or something. Uh, so if, if you're wanting to launch it as another user, uh, you run into that problem. Uh, but at least well, as far I, as... We ran into that problem even trying to launch as the same user. I think it was to do with the way that executable file itself was permissioned or something that we, it was potential for Windows 7 to reject the call. Um, and there is a way to do it if you in, go through all the individual steps and still use create process. Uh, but we ended up using the shell execute functions as a convenience. Yeah, in yeah, some I think cases it's, you need that thing to start off. You're, you're able to do it through combinations of, of these guys and some of the startup information, I think. Uh, yeah, if, if you do all the right incantations. Yeah, there was more to it than that. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not an expert in the area, but it was to do with some sort of security context, which is new in Windows Vista or 7 or something. Oh, okay. So the question is, what if you want to call create process X or create process as user or some other create process function, right? Mm. Well, yes. Mm. But there's a range of functions that have different behaviors on Windows. Yeah. But to come back to your proposal, so I also think that splitting the whole startup thing into separate phases with callbacks that you can modify from the outside is the way to go. And well, one place where a phase could be replaced could be on Windows to either call the create process or mm -hmm. some other food. Yeah, right now, you know, I've just got these two different executors, one for POSIX, one for mm -hmm. Windows. Um, those pre-create, post-create, they are template methods. So. Um, some facility could be made to have different executors that uh, you actually could pass these same initializers into. That's so also from, oh, sorry. from the client perspective, all this looks totally the same. You don't have to do anything different on the different platforms. You would move all that platform-specific behavior down into the appropriate initializer methods. That's also the kind of feedback I'm especially interested in if people think this is an approach we should try. Especially if you look now at this exact function, there's really nothing happening. There's just this create process W code 
and maybe we find another mechanism to replace this too. If you compare this with create child, there's a bunch of other things happening and I had to add more and more things if people had more and more requests. I mean, there's a lot of stuff happening, but if there's something else people like to do, there's just no way to do it. And as here, the executor always calls the initializers in, in the different phases. Well, you can always create a new initializer, pass it, and yeah, it will automatically be called, and you can do then whatever you like. Right, exactly. Are, are there yeah. default initializers that make like the common case? Yes, like simple. Half arcs. That's yeah. what that paths initializer is. And was the do whatever you like approach? I didn't see that yet. I didn't see yet where I how I can conveniently modify the startup info where that's actually living. We haven't seen the user code yet for that, right? Um, well, I'll show okay. you. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, please, no, please, you know your uncle better. <laughs> uh, currently, I just have this macro that creates the member function on the executor mm -hmm. to do each of these things. Um, and each of those just calls fusion for each on each of the initializers. Um, I'm sure Stephen or somebody else has a, a better way of implementing this, either in MPL or fusion. Uh, but this turns around, passes the executor into the particular function, the pre-create, the post-create uh, calls. So it's very thin what this guy is doing. It's just most all the work is being done by the initializers. And the nice thing about that is the stock initializers we're providing are built using the exact same <coughs> approach somebody would extend the system. So on the Windows implementation of the paths initializer, uh, the user interface really is just the constructors of these things. So and it's the exact same on POSIX as it is on Windows. But what they do and when they do it is different. So you're getting the executor passed in. You have access to all the state from that executor. So in this case, we're setting uh, the executable path, the working directory. Um, and we need to uh, give the argument list the full path to the executable that's being going to be launched as well. So not only is the uh, executable path argument to create process needed, but also you need to put that in as the first argument in the argument list. And on Windows, the argument list is a uh, string, single string that goes in, whereas it's a uh, array of strings in uh, POSIX. And if you like to, you can now here also access the startup info member variable mm, of the okay. executor. All these initializers, paths, arcs, whatever they are called. Okay, so there needs to be a naming convention in the members with yeah. compatibility. But yeah, okay, exactly. In, in one yeah. way, or, way or another, you will have that. What I don't see, but maybe I don't get it, is how I could do something like a composition. I want to run a GUI application and set security stuff. Because, well, in the end, as a user, I'd like to have something where I can have a toolbox for stuff which I can apply to a process before I start it and then fire it off. And with that approach, you could compose a bit with um, derivation, but then it gets tricky to chain to pre-create things. Or am I missing something? You have a fusion vector, right? So you can pass in one. You can pa pass in multiple ones. Okay. If you have so a limited yeah, set of, the, of, of, of variables which are passed to create process, for example, in Windows, they are all provided by the executor. You have yeah predefined initializers like pass, because you always have to pass a path to an executable if you want to start one. And if you need something else, because you need to change another variable, which is not modified by one of the existing initializers, you can create a new one. You just need to define the functions like pre for post for whatever they are called. And there you can access then again the variables of the executor and make sure that your child process is started the way you like. I think that's the idea. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you look at this sort of case where you have a parent process, it already has a error log, it wants to launch three children, connect the standard error out to that log. Uh, maybe you want to 
uh, pipe the output of one to the input of another. Um, whether this name is makes sense or not, I don't know. Basically, it represents a directed pipe. Um, and I'm thinking that might be something that should belong in boost IO streams because basically it's a pair of a uh, file descriptor sync and a file descriptor source. And again, IO streams already uh, abstracts away the platform differences. So we don't even need to deal with that aspect. And there was a lot of work in the previous process that was just dealing with trying to um, deal with those platform differences. So then to answer your question about how you might call this, um, mm -hmm. so I just have some namespace aliases. Uh, we have our log being created. Um, I have these, what are effectively directed pipes. And then we call them make child. And make child wraps uh, calling executor constructor and then the exec method. Um, and currently I just have manually overloaded uh, mary uh, functions for make child. And so it ends up uh, <coughs> taking these by const reference, putting them into a fusion vector and making that call to exec. So if you had other uh, initializers that you wanted, uh, you would create those and then just pass them in here. So the constructor would take any parameters that they needed to be used and then they would be called back into at the, ver at the appropriate phase of launching the executable. Can that, so I'm not that, don't know fusion that well. Can I catch uh, consistency errors with this approach? Something That's like? one of the things lacking. Okay. I mean, you could pass five paths in and it's just going to do whatever the last one yeah, With the path, I get, uh, guess it's obvious, but with the redirection, it might get tricky. It, exactly, yeah. So that, that's one of the things I was hoping to learn. I don't know if there's a fusion container <laughs> that would give us that behavior where um, we'd be able to pass in just, uh, you know, ensure that there's just a single type of each of these. I don't know if that would be even sufficient. There may be times when you pass in multiple types. I don't know. I mean, a fusion sequence is just in, is also an MPL sequence. So the easiest way to do it is just to run, create an algorithm that does whatever checking you want to do. Oh, okay. So, I mean, you could have some way of tagging either, of saying you can have multiple instances of this thing. And, and if order, order this were, has to be unique. And if order were specific, we could yeah. reorder them appropriately. And, and oh, okay. just have some way. As long as you have some way of expressing those constraints, you can treat it as a as a just a meta program. Right. Yeah. A lot of the stock initializers, you know, I mean, you could pass them in and make sure they're passed in at the appropriate order, just like they would be. Uh, within the argument list of the create process or the exec call. So, but yeah, definitely that's something that needs to be addressed before this were actually um, put in for review. Uh, must this be addressed before a review? <laughs> that's, we are essentially saying it, program errors, we're going to have to protect them from program errors. That's what it turns out to be, right? So, right. The library is plenty useful without having to figure out what program errors are. So I don't know that that's necessarily something that you want to implement before a review. So yeah, I mean, we found this very useful as it currently is. And um, I mean, the nice thing is I'm here this week and it's the final week of our release. <laughs> but up until I left and I checked my email and no problems with any of this. <laughs> So then the so we have that args initializer, and um, we are deriving from the initializer concept. And if you notice there, all the methods uh, were supplied; they're not virtual. Um, 
but they're supplied with empty uh, bodies. So you don't have to provide those in each of your concrete initializers. It will just use that uh, base class method for um, post create or failed create. It just does nothing. So for ARCs, um, it's a little different from the previous one in that it really just is a composite of other initializers being an ARG initializer. So this guy just does container-like sorts of things. Um, it has, uh, let's see. We just implemented a function call operator on it and so that we could easily fill this thing um, with other args. Um, when the pre-create method is called, we just do a for each, passing each of the arg items and calls its uh, pre-create method, passing the executor back into it. So this guy is more kind of a higher level than the actual argument items that are being passed in. Uh, for our usages, we added a streaming operator. Um, when we do these launching the processes, we have a log file, and we echo the command line back out to this log file so people can see, or our QA people can see what went wrong if it's out at a customer site. Okay. So the only reason you're inheriting from initializer is so that uh, you can get default implementations or various things, right? You don't necessarily have to. Right. Okay. Yeah, there's no, there's no virtual, virtual. Exactly. And this technique I stole from Boost IO Streams. <laughs> so then the ARG initializer. Uh, on Windows, I had to have some additional overloads rather than just a templated one. I'm doing a really... <laughs> Quick and dirty thing using lexical cast to cast to a W string on Windows. Um, for a path, uh, it does the UTF-8, if that's what you specified when you uh, created the path, uh, to Unicode conversion for us. So we get that for free. Uh, we just added over the last week or two, uh, this case, where we pass in a string and a path, so you can do things like dash, some name, equal, and then a path. Um, there's probably, if we had a Unicode library, I could even avoid having to do that. And I think one of the problems I ran into, lexical cast, uh, at least on Windows, will not take a standard string. I had to take the string.c stir. So, you ought to. That's what I thought. <laughs> um, we're back on 144 here, so I don't know if it's been fixed since then. I just haven't had a chance to look at that. Yeah, you got 10 minutes left. So oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, with that definition of our. Uh, we create an args instance. Uh, its constructor just passes through uh, whatever it gets and uh, calls an arg constructor. So the first, this args object is constructed. And then, like the boost spirit symbols class, um, we just overload operator paren so that you can concatenate your args in this fashion. It makes it a little more readable. And because the default constructors are there for the ARG class, uh, we're able to just pass in whatever information that you need. So instead of doing that, could you just take a range or something and then use either in C++ OX and somehow support initializer lists and, or use um, a boost assign instead of manually creating your own? Well, part of the reason that we created our own is it allowed us to um, have in our client code, we have um, functions that return kind of a base set of arguments, and then that's used by other functions that either add or remove arguments, so we needed that particular capability. And then it allowed us to 
um, have some unit tests for this guy itself. And we need it to um, be able to um, do this on both Mac and Windows, uh, in POSIX and Windows, um, and their represent representation of the args that they need to pass to the appropriate exec or the create process are much different. On Windows, they all get concatenated into a single string, um, and they're quoted. Uh, so that you don't run into problems with the argument uh, definitions. You have an extra bracket and then something going. Uh, yep. And then uh, we have some, this is actually should be removed if we're not specifying what standard in, it just doesn't use it on uh, POSIX, it will I think the null device on Windows, uh, it just sets that uh, startup info handle to null. Um, and so if we're launching a Windows GUI application, you don't even specify any of these items. So um, for dealing with standard I.O., one of the uh, complexities was um, supporting just general piping to and from child processes. So for our usage, we didn't need to do any of that. So we kind of backed up so we could work out these concepts with um, just kind of the simplified constraints of dealing with standard in, out, and error. Um, we wanted to be able to uh, specify a path where it would actually construct the file and do the input and output directly from those files right in place. Uh, we also wanted to be able to pass in a file descriptor source or sync. Um, and then also we wanted to be able to pass in one of these directed pipe guys and have it grab the appropriate sync or the source and depending upon uh, the type of the I.O. initializer. So if it's uh, out to, uh, it knows that it's going to grab the sync end of a pipe. Um, if it's an in from, it's going to grab the source end of the pipe. And actually, this is ending up being very similar between uh, both uh, POSIX and Windows. Um, I think with a little more work, you could probably even collapse these guys almost into at least all the boilerplate sorts of things um, into a single class that could be reused for both those um, applications or both those platforms. Uh, and even this guy with the appropriate naming because all we're doing is sending a handle over and handle being a file descriptor. And on Windows it can, hand, it can deal with file descriptors as well as Windows native handles. So one of the things we ran into, since we're a GUI application, um, on Mac, when we'd launch these console type applications, it would just launch, you wouldn't get any windows flashing on the screen or anything. Oh, that looks great. We get over onto Windows, and the first thing we see happening is a console pop. We go, God, that looks sloppy. <laughs> so what we did was create a no console initializer. And so what it's doing is it gets the executor being passed into its pre-create method, and it goes off, sets the appropriate um, DW flags on the startup info guy, and tells it to hide the window. So now we get the same behavior on both Windows and Mac. Uh, the implementation for POSIX for this guy is just empty. Since it derives from that initializer, it just has those empty bodies for all those methods. And since we're using the Fusion, Fusion for each approach, all that stuff should just get compiled out and no calls being made at all. Looks like we've got about five minutes left. 
Uh, I think one of the things, first things we need to do is get this up on the net somewhere for people to have access to. Um, yeah. So I have to work on that and, and uh, post on the mailing list where, where that can be found. If you'd like, you can put it into a collaborator and that will drive the review <coughs> process for you guys this time. It, it, so what's funny is when you started your presentation, I was a little agitated because it seemed like, well, you know, there was a lot of good things in that initial library. And uh, so, but it seems to me that we've come another step. And so maybe the review process is working. Okay, that, that's good to know because that's the feedback we need. Because mm -hmm. this changes, of course, the entire library. Um, yeah. Five years, we never touched the design. I, I always worked on a couple of things, as I said. I don't see myself as the author. And if Jeff likes to work on this and can finish this and publish this, it would be, of course, great. Yeah, and all the focus of this really has been on the, the launching of it. Um, we can terminate, there's a terminate, there's actually a monitor class uh, that takes the result of the make child. Uh, and the reason I split that out is uh, so that, at least in our case, we had, uh, as data members, the, the child uh, type and didn't want to bring in all the system headers because of that. And the, the previous design, that was the case. So I separated out this monitor uh, type uh, class that takes a child and then you can do the, and I renamed white to join to be like uh, the threads class. And um, uh, so you can do a join. Uh, it, you can actually pass in a um, exception type so it will actually uh, abstract out the return type code because that was another area that was non-platform uh, independent and then you can do a terminate on that also. That was the only need we had on there. We didn't have a need to do the asynchronous way. If it were available and all worked together with this, it would have been useful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, if, if, if most of us think we should try this, then I think we will just go ahead with this and see where it leads to. I had a couple of more slides, there are a couple of more ideas, but there's no need to change now again. Oh, okay. uh, the computer, I will just upload uh, the presentation to the website anyway. And yeah, that is really the major change and that's the important thing where it would be nice to get some feedback so we can agree on something and move forward. Yeah. But it looks like that, yeah, people think... Well, I was still on the same thing. About I, I'll say I'm still undecided. I think there's, I think there's promise here. Um, I have to wrap my head around it more to decide whether um, I see what you're trying to solve and you know you need these points to be able to get at the stuff and, you know recreate and all that kind of stuff might be able to do it and I'm trying to figure out what I like and dislike about that. Um, so I'm wondering whether either something like recreate versus create needs to be explicitly renamed to belong to the Windows case or whether it can be unified because you've got the pre-create, you've got the pre fork You can do different stuff at that point. You've got different executor objects available at that point. So I'm wondering whether that can be unified or whether that's completely impossible and then I'd vote for split it rather. Mm -hmm. Also, the, the, I think it goes back to your one thing about proposed building, and I see this one where it's just, it's called no console and does one little thing. How do I mix this in with my other initializer that does something else? And I want to derive the two, I want to compose by deriving my third initializer based on these two other ones, and then have some well, preprocessor. You, you, you can still do that, right? Well, not as they both have pre-create in it. Well, I, have, I don't want to do anything in my third one. I don't want my third one to have so a pre-create that calls the other two pre-creates. If you want only two of them, you just add them as two executors, uh, two uh, initializers, and Fusion takes care of running one and then okay, running great. the next one. <laughs> All right. If you want to share functionality... I'm so relaxed create, that you had the same problem. In. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you want to share functionality, then you derive, and then the derived class becomes the only one. So that's really a completely okay. up to you. Library doesn't exist. I think from, from my standpoint, I'd like to see Common, common interfaces such as popen, popen2, popen3 built on top of this and, and usable because those are very common use cases that somebody just wants to be able to mm -hmm. spawn a, a child process, 
get access to, to the three ends of those streams and be able to use them. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's where the library started. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because you know, those very basic you, know, three, you need something like ASIO or do you select on your own, otherwise it's a bit pointless. It, 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 you're right. It, you need uh, some higher level piece yeah. to deal with that. So it, I'm not convinced that it belongs into that. So it would be a nice convenience into it if in ASIO you've got some bridge to process that you can say, okay, I write POE three and then get out stuff that uh, some uh, IO objects, whatever, uh, and plug them into ASIO. That, yeah, that, that would be I, perfect. I would, I would actually see the dependencies the other way around. Yeah, uh, I would agree. Uh, you know, we would use, we would. Expect P open three to exist here and use ASIO to manage that. But see, I mean, it sounds like the sort of thing that could just be written as a template function in the header file somewhere, and so it's really it's pure extension to both libraries, potentially. Right. I think we're done for now. Thank you yeah. for the feedback. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.